you want to say good morning? Good. Say good morning. I don't know. Say good morning. Can you do? You do it. Me to do. Say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Stillwater's church. So good to be here. Pray for air conditioning, please. I'm going to start us off in a word of prayer, and then we'll worship the Lord. Amen. Sorry, just trying to catch my breath. Heavenly Father, oh gosh, we are so grateful, Lord, that we can come before you today so freely, Lord Jesus. Just lay our burdens at your feet. Lord, there's so much going on in the world right now, and I pray father that people would recognize we need to put you back in it that they would stop trying to take you out that's the downfall lord i pray that you bless each and everyone here that you would bless the message let it fall in our hearts and in our minds lord so we can go out and be more like you there's so much devastation going on right now. Lord, please heal. Let us come before you and worship, Lord. We just love you, Father. We thank you for those that are here. We thank you for those that will see us on, um, on the internet, Lord. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless Darren as he travels up, Lord God. We thank you, Father. We love you. And it's in your most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Who's ready to worship the Lord today? Two, three, four.
One, two. We're no you, longer slaves. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Thank you, Jesus. Of deliverance. Yes. From my enemy till all my fears are gone. Yes, take it away, Lord. I no longer slave to fear. Take it away, Lord. I am a child of God. Yes, we are, Lord. And I'm no longer a slave. You know, when I look back my life, and sometimes I think that God was silent, and then I was wondering where he is. He was, actually. 
And I look back, and then I always, he always scold me that he has this whole thing under control. I was just looking at the little, little picture over here, and then you see the whole picture. Maybe that's what you're going through. But he never failed me yet.
still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still want is a just a little closer walk with thee. Put your hands together. Let's have some fun. Here we go. I am weak but thou art strong.
Well, let's come to the Word of God this morning. And we'll find ourselves in a couple of places this morning in Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, verse 13, and also in John's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Uh, you'll see them on the screen in a moment. But before we uh, say anything else, let's come to the Lord and ask for his help. Uh, truly, I can't do this without him. And uh, we want to hear from God through the Holy Spirit this morning. We don't want to hear from me. We want to hear from him because he has truth for us. Amen? So why don't we pray and ask for his help. Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we've come into your house with an expectation that we might meet with you. And if we've come here, Lord, to not meet with you, then truly it is a waste of our time. There's nothing that a man's wisdom can bring you of any fruitfulness. And so I pray right now that you would use me simply as a megaphone, a mouthpiece, to speak your words as you bring them to me. I thank you for your word which guides us, guides us into all truth and gives us what we need for the week and for the life that we have. And I do pray over anyone here, Lord, who's maybe not fluent in your scriptures and your word, Lord, that you'd remove uh, any hindrances to their, to their mind, that they'd comprehend and apprehend the word of God. Mostly, Lord, we want to experience your love and your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness. Father, each of us are sinners saved by grace, myself included, and I need to be forgiven for the sins of this week, for this day. And I pray you to cleanse us all, for you promised you would. Let us now enter into your presence and have communion with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I think it's interesting that I would talk about dehydration this morning. It was this last week that um, I was doing some work uh, out in my secular work and then at home that I, I noticed myself at some point I started to feel a little weak, a little woozy. Um, you know, my power level had gone way down and uh, I started to feel dizzy. And um, I recognized there was something wrong. And so I did the old, it started to occur to me, maybe I'm dehydrated. I started thinking about, did I drink today? Did I, you know, and it's been so hot. Um, obviously, a lot of us realize that for our body weight, we're supposed to be drinking like 50, 70, 80 ounces of water. And uh, most of us don't even come close to that uh, per day. So um, I, I kind of tested my skin. If you pinch your skin and it stands up, and it goes down very slowly, you know you're getting dehydrated. So if you know that, and you do that till the test, I immediately recommend to you, you go and um, get a drink. It's preferably water, something with um, some electrolytes in it to get you rehydrated. But I remember feeling that way and, and recognizing I might be dehydrated. I, I went and grabbed a nice drink, and, and it was like a wonderful little miracle. I, I'm drinking it, and if you could put my my body on a screen, its interior, where there was deadness, all of a sudden, as the, as the fluids went in, there was life. And instantly my wooziness went away, and I started to feel strong. And I started to feel like, wow, wow. And, and a lot of times I do this, and, and, and it's not a good habit, and I don't recommend you do it. I'll let myself get to that point, that when I drink, I'm actually drink so much that I forget I need to breathe. And I drink, 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 and I go, because <gasps> I, I, I just... If, if I could not breathe and just drink, I probably would just keep drinking. Because my body is telling me, no, no, you need this. And it, and it requires it, it wants it. And so as I'm drinking, I just feel life come inside of me. And I feel much better because now my body has been hydrated. I wanted to read to you the definition of, of dehydration. Water is a critical element of the body. And keeping the body adequately hydrated is a must to allow the body to function. Up to 60% of the body's weight is made up of water. Most of the water is found within the cells of the body, the intracellular space. The rest is found in the extracellular space, which consists of the blood vessels, the intravascular space, and the spaces between cells called the interstitial space. Dehydration occurs when the amount of water leaving the body is greater than the amount being taken in. And we know that... Uh, 
water leaving the body comes through perspiration, right? We sweat. We know that. If we have a shirt on, we start to see the stains on our backs and under our arms and on our bellies and everywhere. And so I think it's important for us to, because we're going to put a spiritual connection to, to holy and, and uh, spiritual dehydration, but notice dehydration occurs when the amount of water leaving the body is greater than the amount being taken in. Uh, the body is very dynamic and is always changing. This is especially true with water in the body. We lose water routinely when, number one, we breathe and in humidified air leaves the body. This can be seen on a cold day. When you can see your breath in the air, which is just water that has been exhaled. Another way we can, we can see lo us losing water is sweat to cool the body. And we also can see uh, when we eliminate waste by urinating and having a bowel movement. In a normal day, a person has to drink a significant amount of water to replace the routine loss. So now I want to put a spiritual connection to dehydration. I believe that, that God gave me a way. He does that often in my life. Circumstances of life happen, and, I, and it's amazing that God will use circumstances of life to teach me spiritual lessons. I'm sure he does that in your life too. You just have to be in tune to that. You know, when things get hard or things go wrong, it's, it's, it's a good practice to say, God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? And so through, through de de dehydration uh, this week, God taught me and showed me within a very quick amount of time as I started thinking about dehydration, immediately I thought of John chapter 7, which Jesus says to the Jews, to, the, to those who had come to the temple, to celebrate during the, the festival. If anyone is thirsty, he may come unto me. And so I thought about that. I thought about how important hydration is to the human body. The bottom line is, is we can't live without water. If you stop drinking, you will die. The human body is not designed to function without liquid, without water, without hydration. And I thought about that in a spiritual sense. Why is it so many of us, and I'm going to include myself in this, go through dry spells in our spiritual life? Where we're kind of like, just, uh, you know, the shoulders go down, the head goes down, and we actually are in this powerless state in which we feel like we, we, we remember the precepts that we, we, we are saved, we have Jesus Christ. And if you don't today, if you don't have a living, vital relationship with Jesus Christ, and you're wondering why you just feel so dead inside, is because you need Jesus. <laughs> you need the Holy Spirit. You need the life that is imparted through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. I just want to caveat that with you. You may have found artificial means, and I'll talk about that in a second, to, to bring life, but it never lasts, and it's not fruitful, and it's not fulfilling. Um, I'm going to give you my own testimony of how I used to do that. But to make this a spiritual application, I want you to realize that in our spiritual lives, we can become spiritually dehydrated. And what do we need? We need holy hydration. We need to be filled up by God. And God has a specific plan on how he does that, a perfect plan. And if you remember when Jesus was on his way to the cross. He started telling his disciples about it. They became afraid. And they asked, where are you going? And he tells them, where I'm going, you can't come. And you won't be able to find me. And the scripture that we're going to read in John 7 in a minute, it will expose why the answer to that way that God, that Jesus was saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be leaving you and where I'm going, you can't go, and you won't be able to find me. What Jesus was explaining is that, was basically telling them in a cloaked way, was that, yeah, I'm leaving, and you're gonna, if you're going to look for me in my body, you won't find me, because I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, and I'm going to go to be with the Father. <coughs> but what had yet to happen, the only way that the Holy Spirit could come was Jesus had to die. And then his Spirit came to live and reside in those who would believe in him. And so Jesus wanted them to know 
that although they were drinking of him at the time when he was alive, there was going to come a time when he wouldn't be there to drink from. And that's an important thing for us to understand this morning. If there's, a, if there's a time in your lives, and maybe it's right now, maybe, and I just want to say this to you, that many times in my life, and it's happened often, I'm going through something in my life, you're going to hear a sermon on it. So sometimes I preach a sermon, and some people think, who told him? He was, he was preaching to me. How dare he correct me like that? A lot of times, please, I want you to understand, that's the Holy Spirit. That's just God doing his thing. He knows what you need. I, I truly don't know. Some cases, I do, because you might ask me to pray for you, or you might come to me for spiritual counsel uh, in ministry, and, and so I do know some things about you guys. Some, some are not revealed to me. You know, we all want to look like spiritual giants. I don't want to tell the pastor what I'm really going through or who I really am, because then he'll think less of me. I just, can I just tell you something? I would never do that, and I'm going to tell you why. Because Without Jesus Christ, I'm much worse than any of what you could be. I just want you to know that. So please don't ever think you're coming to a self-righteous, holier-than-thou pastor who's going to sit and go, wow, what a sin that you can't get your act together. Ah, too bad you're not so spiritual like me. It's just not true. Matter of fact, it's not happened yet in my ministry for many years. I've never heard someone come to me with some fallen story of fallenness that I went, because I can look at my own life and say, if they only knew, I've done much worse than that. God has cleansed me and showed mercy and grace to me in a much bigger way. But some people are so afraid to be seen in that light. But please don't ever be afraid in that way. But you can get to a place in your life where, where you're just spiritually dehydrated. There's a thirst inside of you that you're looking to fill, not different from the thirst you felt before you met Jesus Christ, before you came into relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you remember those days when there was just desire inside of you for satisfaction, and, and you looked for it all over the world and in so many different places? I remember my own life. It was not uncommon. There was a travel agent in Revere where I grew up uh, called Northgate Travel, and at the time it was probably one of the only travel agents around, and everyone went there, and I was notorious to wake up on any given day and feeling depressed and feeling empty and feeling like just pitiful that I would say, I know, I need a vacation, right? And so before work, I was self-employed. I'd go down to Northgate Travel and I'd walk in and the girls would instantly start smiling and laughing because I was there all the time. And uh, they're like, where are you going now, Darren? And I'd say, well, I was thinking about doing that cruise. And they're like, yeah, we got plenty of cruises for you. Girls thinking, ching, ching, okay, it's my commission, nice. And I would book a trip. And you know, the most wonderful thing would happen. That thirst and that hunger and that emptiness would be satisfied in that moment. Because I'd start anticipating it, okay. They'd say to me, when do you want to leave? i say, can I leave today? No, Dad, there's no cruise that leaves today. I'm like, all right, when's the next one? Well, I think we can get you in on this one. It leaves in three weeks. I'm like, okay, book it. And often, I didn't want to go by myself, so I'd call up a friend that'd say, hey, I'm going to be going such and such a cruise, such and such a vacation, in three weeks, you want to come? Oh, I'd love to come. I can't afford it, though. And I'd say, all right, I'll pay. You, you can come. Because I just didn't want to be alone, and I, and I, listen, this is the extent I would go to to get filled up. Because that emptiness... It, that isolation, that depression was so painful. I would have, I would have taken, if somebody said, I got to take my family of five with me, I probably would have paid for all of them too because I couldn't let anything get in the way of, of that, that artificial feeling. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I was using a vacation to try to soothe and anesthetize the pain inside of me. I used vacations. There was a time in my life when I used alcohol. I never got heavy into drugs, but there was a time when I, I did a little bit of drugs, but not a lot, very little, a matter of fact. But there was a time when I used sex to anesthetize the pain. Or I used an automobile. I'll never forget, I was very depressed. And I, I, please, what I'm saying to you, I hope you see it as folly. I hope you see it as stupidity. But one time, I was so depressed, I went and bought a Corvette. Huh. 
I think back. Wow. Unbelievable. Good thing I never got in the QVC. I'd be in big trouble. There'd be packages piling up at my doorfront. And, and don't get me wrong, I think there are a lot of people who actually use spending. I just need something new. I just need something new. I am sure that people get packages at the, at the door, and they're kind of like, I didn't order this. And the lady, yeah, you did. You ordered it. Because you don't realize at 2 in the morning, you were miserable. You bought that Ginzu knife that you really didn't need, but it just gave you a satisfaction to buy something, and something new was going to come into your life. People will tell you, the shopaholics, they, that's what they do. They buy things they don't remember even buying them. They just kind of, and they, as a result, they get it. They really didn't need it. It was about the inspiration and the feeling they got from purchasing, and they just put it on the pile. They never open it. Brand new. Ends up at a flea market for a, qu a quarter of the price. But I remember I used to use things like that to try to satisfy the emptiness inside of me. There was a thirst and there was a hunger. And I thought that there were fleshly, worldly things that could satisfy it. And Satan was great giving me suggestions. Oh, was he good. He used my flesh. He, he, if it felt good, if it looked good, I did it. There was one problem. That when I got that thing and I accomplished and had those things, here's what always happened, invariable. It ended and the joy ended and the emptiness returned. And the depression returned, and the pain returned, and the fear returned. And as a result, I reverted to what I knew, which was to go have a drink, go out to a club, meet another girl, do this and do that, or whatever I did. And, and again, there was that temporary fulfillment. Well, I want you to know where that led me to. That led me to a place of desperation. After I had worked so hard and spent so much money and time and effort to try to fill myself up, it was like pouring water in a bucket that had a hole in it. I never could get filled up. And you know what happened after time, time, after time, after time? It escalated. It reminds me of someone who takes one drink after work just because it takes the, you know, it just makes me feel comfortable after work. You know what happens after a while? You have the one, and then the one doesn't do it anymore. So now you have two. And then two doesn't do it. And then you have three. <laughs> and you know the story. It's, a, it's all downhill from there. You're going to have, and then the alcohol doesn't do it anymore. Now you need to have a little something with the alcohol. And it's just, it's, it's, it's a never-ending rat trap. And I remember I got to a place in my life where I was completely empty. I was in a dark place. I had returned back to my parents' house. My father had, had had a heart attack. He almost died. He had quadruple bypass. I felt burdened to come back home and, and help my dad. And so I moved into, I built a basement apartment. I moved in, you know, the ultimate bachelor pad. And I filled myself up with all these fleshly things. And that led me to one night after going out and drinking, I sat in my bed I laid in my bed and I stared at the ceiling at 2 in the morning. And I started to become overwhelmed with fear and depression. And in that darkness, I prayed to God and I said, take my life. Take my life. Because I was in so much pain. And I'd already learned that the vacation wasn't going to be the answer that the car wasn't going to be the answer, that that next relationship wasn't going to be the answer, and more money wasn't going to be the, ins the answer, because I had all those things. But they wasn't doing it. And so, in the midst of complete deadness, I begged God. I said, please, Lord, take my life. And I begged him and asked him over and over and over again. And I finally, it occurred to me, I said, God, you're not going to answer that prayer, are you? You love me too much. I said, Lord, just please let me go to sleep then. Because I tossed and turned for hours and I was tortured. I said, Lord, please, just take this pain away. Take this lost feeling away. And you know what happened? I fell asleep. And I woke up in the morning and guess what God did for me? He took away the desire to die. He took away the desire to give up. 
I have no other explanation other than it was a miracle from God. He heard my cry, and he answered my prayer. And I woke up with hope in my heart. And it's no coincidence that after that, this came to my heart. I got to get back to church. I need to get back to God. I, 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 I really recognize that this is the problem. I was spiritually dehydrated. I was empty because what my, God's plan for my life was to keep a life giving Holy Spirit, non quenching, uh, quenching filling of my life through the Holy Spirit. And I had forsaken it. I had forsaken God's eternal life that He promised me through the life of Christ imparted through the Holy Spirit. I had abandoned it. Now, as I was thinking of this for the sermon, I thought about the mistake the nation Israel made in God's correction. He used the prophet Jeremiah to correct his people. You know what's beautiful about that God used Jeremiah? Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. It reminds me of me. There was a time when I started first preaching to a congregation that every time I preached, I cried. It was embarrassing. People made fun of me. Oh, pastor's going to cry. Here he goes. It's coming. Floodgates are open, and, I, and, I, and, and people would love, you know, I lovingly, some of them not lovingly, would, you know, remind me that, you know, oh, that's the crying pastor. And I, used to, I would just say to them, hey, God chose Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, so too bad. That's who I am. And um, still happens to this day, not as much, and sometimes I say, Lord, bring that man back, because that's a sensitivity to the heart of God. God weeps when he looks at the sin of the world. God weeps when he sees his people fall for the lie of the enemy that says, it's not, God is not your answer. You need a better job. You need another husband. You need another medication. You need more drinks. You need thus. You need that. And they fall for it. And Satan knows what he's doing. He knows those things will never satisfy. Never. And he knows where it will leave you forsaken. So we can learn from the mistakes of God's people of the past. A lot of the Old Testament is an open book to the failure of God's people, the nation Israel. You look at their mistakes, you say, why did they do that? Have you ever thought like, why did Eve and Adam eat that apple? If they didn't, we wouldn't have any sin. We'd all be in the Garden of Eden. There'd be no problem, right? Because if it was you or me, right, we wouldn't have ate of the apple, right? Right? Wrong. You eat that apple every day. You eat that apple almost every day. Listen, you don't have to admit it to me. God knows the truth. I know me. Because we're always looking for something more. That's just, it's part of our carnality, our flesh. It's really never satisfied. Do you think God knew that when he made us, that we would never be satisfied? If you think back to the Garden of Eden, they had everything they needed and more and they didn't have to farm it's not like adam and eve woke up every day and they said all right honey get on the plow we're going to plant some seed and we're going to grow some bananas and some peaches and some apples no listen don't forget in the garden of eden there was no rain my grass right now because it's not rained is brown and it doesn't grow but how did god do that in the Garden of Eden. No rain. And everything grew lush. <laughs> because God hydrated it. And he brought life. And he brought life abundantly. Do you hear me? Listen. If you're just rolling out of bed in the morning and you're just making it through the day, I assure you, you are not being equipped by the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you've grieved the Holy Spirit. You've done something. It can be disobedience. It could be worse. It can be just ignoring God. You know? I'll, God, I'll give you this much just so I can say, yeah, I believe in God. But you don't do anything to live a life that honors Him, or I don't. Sometimes I sound like I'm telling you that it's you guys or it's not me. No, no, no. <laughs> it's me too. Because I've felt, there's been times lately that I've felt spiritually dehydrated, and I know why that is. I know it. 
It's the same reason why I felt it in my early 20s. It's because I'm not spending as much time with Jesus as I used to. You see, the more time I spend in intimacy with him, the more I pray to him, the more I seek him, the more I find him. That's what the Bible says. If you seek him with all your heart, you'll find him. All your heart. And yet we're so distracted in our world today. There's so many other things to worry about. My new thing to worry about is do I have my mask? You know, my whole life has been wallet in the right back pocket, money in the right front pocket, left pocket empty for incidentals, back pocket always, left pocket always empty. That's not my new life. My new life is those things plus I always have a mask in my left pocket. That's just the, the new normal, right? But for me, I need to learn from my mistakes. It's often that I'll be working, and I hope he doesn't mind, but I work with my son sometimes, and I'll tell him, don't do it that way, do it this way, and we butt heads sometimes, and I said, listen, I'm not smarter than you. I'm not trying to make you feel like you don't know what you're doing. You do know what you're doing. You're very good at what you do. But I don't want to see you make the mistakes I made. Amen? Uh, he's going to make plenty on his own that have nothing to do with me. But there's mistakes I've made in the trade. There's ways I used to use tools. There's, there's decisions I used to make that never came out good. H historically, every, every time I did it that way, I just made my life harder. So when I come across those, I, I don't do that. I, I know how this is going to end. This is going to be bad. <laughs> don't do it that way. Don't use that tool away. Don't, you know, put that new blade in. And so I instruct because, because not because I'm an old up, because I don't want to see him make the same mistakes. And so when we look at the nation Israel, we can look at their failure, and for us it can be an answer and a protection. Look what it says in Jeremiah 2.13. For my people, this is, this is God speaking directly through Jeremiah. He says, tell my people, for my people have done two evil things. Don't miss that. Evil. They were evil to God. Number one, they have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And number two, they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now keep in mind, we're talking about hydration. Right? We can become dehydrated. But there's always a Wendy's, there's always a McDonald's, there's always a 7 Eleven, there's always a there's always a market pass. We can go and get hydrated pretty easily. They lived in the desert. Water was sparse, if at all. There was no water. Water was life in the desert. Can you imagine the heat and the humidity day after day with the sun beating down? Without water, you can't live. And Jesus uses, God is using this as a demonstration to, the, to his own people. He's saying to them, you have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. You know what the imagery he's giving them? He's giving the imagery of an artesian well. He's giving them an in image of, if, if they were traveling in the wilderness and they were looking for a place to camp, you know what they'd look for? They'd look for any sign of life. They'd look for greenery or some sort of plant life. And that would mean that there's water somewhere because that plant can't grow without water. And sometimes they'd come across a fountain of water just pumping up out of the ground into a lush oasis. And the minute they would find some place like that, what do you think they would do? Oh, we're camping here. Sweet home, Alabama. This is where we're living now. Why? Because the water is so essential for life. And they would build up around it, and usually cities would form around the water. Very common. Because that's how critical the water was. And God is saying to his people, you have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. He's giving them a picture of water just keeps bubbling up, fresh clean. It just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And it came from God. You've given that up. You've traded that in and you've dug yourself cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. If you don't know what a cistern is, a cistern was man-made. 
And what the nation of Israel would do is they'd go into a rocky area, a rock formation, and they would, at great labor and great work and sweat and tears, would take mallets and chisels, and they would chisel out the rock and make a bowl. And they would chisel probably for days and maybe years to create these cisterns, these holders of water, so that it would rain. Now, mind you, where did the rain come from? God. And it would come down, and it would fill it up. Kind of like you see today, people collect water in their, off their gutters, and they, they reclaim it, and they use it for water inside the house. It gets filtered. It's ingenious, right? It's free. It came from God. You can use it to wash your clothes. You can use it to bathe in. You can use it for hosing off the lawn. It's a, it's a great thing to do to save money. But God, they, they took it upon themselves to create these cisterns. Now, the only problem with these cisterns, and, and God's revealing it to them, is that they can't hold water. They don't ultimately do the trick because here's two, two bad things happen. Number one, for the time that they, they, they fill up, they sit stagnant in the heat. Anyone want to go down to the, late, uh, the nearest pond and take a drink? Anybody? No. Why? Because there's algae growing in it. Why? Because the, the sun is just beating down on it, and it's not being filtered. It's not, you know, when, you, if, when I go hiking, maybe you have, what's one of the first things I do is I'm going up the mountain, I look for streams. Because I love when I can just go to the stream, because it's water coming down the mountain, it's getting filtered through rocks and through sand. You can put it in your hand and you taste it. How's it taste? Unbelievable. I think I found Poland Spring. It's, it's unbelievable. It's so fresh and it's so... Re you drink it and you're like, oh, wish I could bottle this. This is, this is awesome. But they were creating these cisterns that would, that would fill up with water for a time and it would become stagnant. And they were substituting that for what God could provide for them. Now, here's the worst part. Is that even though they'd create these cisterns, within the rock there'd be veins. There'd be little cracks. So those cisterns were temporary. They didn't hold water permanently so that there'd be a resource for them. If it rained, they would fill up. But if you go back in a few days, they'd be empty. Why? Because it would, the cracks would let the water out. And so that's what God's saying to them. He's giving them this analogy, this picture. I'm the living fountain. I'm the one who fed you and, and, and quenched your thirst in the wilderness. I don't know if you remember when the nation Israel, they were supposed to remember their past. When they were in the wilderness, when they had left Pharaoh, when they had left Egypt, God had taken them supernaturally out of there. He used Moses. And they went and they pot he potted the Red Sea. Wow. Unbelievable. God created a way of escape. He'll do that for you too, by the way. And then they get out into the wilderness, okay? There's no market basket. There's no drive throughs There's no... How are they going to drink? How are they going to eat? God, all they had to do was ask God, and they did. They were reliant on God, so they asked God. And what did God do? Manna fell from heaven. So much manna that they got, it came out of their nostrils. They said, I don't want any more manna. Manna, morning, noon, and night, enough manna. God, we want meat. So what did God do? Because they asked God. He's their provision. He's their well. He's going to always provide for them. And mind you, when they asked for food, he gave them manna. He didn't just give them just a snack. He gave them so much bountifully that they, they couldn't contain it. God will do that in your life too. But then they got sick of that. So the way, God's, the way we are in our flesh is that we're never satisfied. We want meat now, God. Right? And God brings the quails to hover two feet off the ground. All they, all they have to do is take a stick and go, boom. There's Monday's dinner, boom. There's Tuesday's. I'm going to eat three times on Wednesday, boom, boom, boom. They could just kill the quail because God brought them in healthy, filled with beautiful meat, and he brought them and made them hover low to the ground, two feet off the, two feet off the ground, and they could just club them, and that was their meal. They didn't have to work for it. God provided it. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? They didn't have to work for it. And they forsook that loving hand of provision the way God lovingly provided for them. And why did he do it? Because they were his children. Because he loves them. And he loves you this morning. He said he would never leave you or forsake you because a good, loving father never leaves you or forsakes you. And they had forsaken that loving hand. 
And, they, and, and what did they replace it with? They worked hard to create a substitute that let them down, that actually made them sick. And I'm telling you this this morning because that's what we do. That's where you find yourself in spiritual dehydration. As when you have forsook God, you stopped asking God, you stopped relying on God, you stopped including God in your life. And you started looking to substitutes to satisfy your life. And they will never satisfy. They will leave you empty and alone. And that's exactly what Satan wants. And he works on your flesh to think, no, 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 I need that pornography. No, 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 I need that drink. No, 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 I need to work more hours, spend less time with my family so I can have that bigger house. It's all a broken cistern. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And God was so hurt by it, he sent his man of tears. Because I, there's no doubt in my mind. See, the only thing that's tough about the word of God is you can't really... You can't, you can't hear the voice of Jeremiah. But because we know Jeremiah often weeped when he taught, we know that when he said these things to the people, he said it with tears in his eyes. They have abandoned me. The fountain of living water. They have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. You can hear the brokenness of God. Why did you leave me? Wasn't I good enough? Didn't I show you how much I loved you? Didn't I save you in your drunken stupors year after year? Didn't I protect you when you had no money? Didn't, aren't you alive today? Remember that diagnosis that the doctor said would surely take your life? Did it? Why? Why did you leave me? It's a good question. God deserves all of our attention, all of our love, because he is still a good God who has much to provide you for. And you know what breaks my heart is when I... I'm with someone and they start telling me of the hardship, of the pain, of the isolation, of the bewilderment and the hopelessness. And I know why it's happening. Because you've forsaken your first love. I want to tell you something that will, I hope, bring joy into your heart. Is that God never closes his arms. He doesn't say, I'm done with you, Darren. How many times are you going to do this to me? You don't love me. I'm not going to be a beating pole for you. I'm not going to let you use and abuse me anymore. Get out of here. You see, when you're a child of God, you will always be his child, and he will always love you. The same way, no matter what my children do, or my grandchildren, no matter how much they fail, and if they fail, and I'm not saying they failed, but if they fail, they can never go too far out of my love. They can't. They can't. And you can never go too far from God's love. But with this, broke, with this message, there was brokenness in the heart of Jeremiah. He knew the message God had given him. And, and, and I believe even in his own heart, he started to see, Lord, this is why this is why our people are going to go into bondage, isn't it? And they did. Captured by the Assyrians, put into bondage, taken out of their homeland because they forsook God. Don't wonder why life is hard and, and, and you're alone and you're isolated. Don't wonder why. Just know you have to turn around and go back and come back to Jesus. Come back into communion. Come back into a relationship. Intimacy. God wants to know you. He wants to love you. And he wants you to know him. His goodness. Don't forsake that fountain that wells up. You see, many of us work hard every day. We're, we're chiseling away at our own systems because I don't need God. I'll, I'll supply my own thirst. I'll quench my own thirst. And just know it will never work. It's not supposed to work. Are you running on empty this morning? Are you thirsty? 
Look at John 7, 37, 39 with me. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living waters, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit who had been given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Are you thirsty? The Bible, God's word, gives us a remedy. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. I, hope, I, I know it, it's a ministry to me right now, but I pray that these might be the very words that you've forgotten that we all forget, is that Jesus is always there. Come to me. Really, truly believe in me. Let me be a fountain to fill you up. What is the fountain? The fountain is the Holy Spirit that's imparted to you the day you fully believe in Jesus Christ. It's imparted to you. That's what Jesus said. He said, anyone who believes in me may come and drink. Anybody. Me, you, the guy having beers next door, he can come. And he can drink and be satisfied. And what will happen? Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Rivers of living water. Now here's the part you can't miss. A lot of people come to Christianity and come to God because they, ha they do realize they're empty. They do realize they need to be filled. They are desperate. And they come and they drink of Jesus and they get filled up. But then that's all that happens. That's not God's plan for you to just receive. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, for the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from the heart of that believer. <laughs> this is so powerful. God's plan is for you to believe in him, to be filled up by his Holy Spirit, and then for his Holy Spirit to flow out of you into the world and into other lives. Love someone like Jesus would love them. See what happens. Exhibit and live the peace that the Holy Spirit imparts, and people will want it. Exude the joy that comes from the confident knowing that God loves you so much, and live it in the world, and see what happens. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen to me. You know why you're thirsty? Because you need me, you need my Holy Spirit to actually put your work and your life to the place it's supposed to be. Do you know what the best life you can live is? We hear a lot of that today. You know what the best life you can live today? Is a tool in God's hand. Is for God to use you, for his Holy Spirit, which, in, which brings about, produces love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and temperance and faith. When that comes into your life and then flows like a rushing river out of your life, it will overwhelm people around you. We have a neighbor going through a tremendous crisis in life for her and her children. And when she comes to our house, here's what she says. I don't know what it is. I love being here. I don't want to go home. And we've told her many times, that's Jesus. Jesus is in our home. That's what you need. You need Jesus. But that's the secret of a full life. It's not for you to just take in the blessings and everything that God wants to do for you. Yep, I'm saved. I'm going to, going to heaven. Thank you very much. Now I'll go live my life. No. 
God imparted the Holy Spirit to you because he knows that's the greatest need of every human life is to be used by God. You don't know it until you do it. You don't know it. When you, when you start to receive the love of God and it works and it starts to flow out of your life, you say, how can I keep this a secret? I've got to give it to somebody else. They need it too. And with courage and purpose, you start to tell people, listen, I see you struggling. I see you working so hard and you're not getting anywhere. Please, I used to do the same thing. You need Jesus. Come to church. Read this devotional. Let me pray with you right now. They need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. And when we start to feel spiritually dehydrated, we need holy hydration and it can only be imparted by a relationship with Jesus Christ. It can only be given to you through the Holy Spirit as he indwells you. He becomes that fountain. Do you see the picture? Fresh, vibrant, living water bubbling up. And you know what's best about it is it never stops. It never stops. You know what's good about that? The more it bubbles up, the more of a source you have to give out. Remember what dehydration was? Dehydration occurs when water leaving the body is greater than the amount taken in. So what if I had a backpack on with an unlimited supply of fluid? Would I ever be dehydrated? No, because I'm constantly being filled up. Do you think God knows what he's doing? He knew that they would, you'd be going into a dry and eerie wilderness of the world. He knew your life would be filled with trouble and pain and an adversary who was going to try to make you live according to the means of your flesh, he knew. And so he gave us the Holy Spirit as we believe. He didn't get us saved and said, good luck, now you're on your own. No. He equipped us to live out the Christian life, a holy life, a godly life, a loving life. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, pictured here, is that fountain. Don't forsake it. You will never find anything to replace it. No matter if you search high and low, no matter how hard you work, you'll never make enough money. My father worked his whole life so hard and got a wonderful pension, and half of it's gone in the stock market. Don't rely on those things. Rely on Jesus. Rely on God. He has never let you down. Take an inventory. Do you remember? Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him would have everlasting life, would never perish and have everlasting life. That's Jesus is when Moses was in the desert. They were thirsty. And God told Moses, hit the rock. And the rock sprung out water. And it, it, never, it just kept on bubbling up. Jesus is your rock. And he's solid. And you can count on him. Make him your first go-to. Put him where he belongs. Pray. Seek. You'll find. And you'll be satisfied. Amen? You will. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I want to thank you so much for how you speak to me. And I pray, Lord, that this picture of this fountain of fresh living water springing up, that it would never leave our minds, that we would recognize we have that in you. that our thirst and hunger for righteousness is a good thing and it's satisfied in you. And I pray for everyone here, Lord, who have maybe forsaken you or ignored you or some don't even know that you're the fountain they can drink from. In all cases, Lord, would you reveal yourself powerfully and help us, Lord, to rely on you and to reject 
those imitation. Help us, Lord, never to replace you. I lift up everyone here this morning, Lord, if there's anyone who's in this state of dehydration, I pray that you would fill them now by your Holy Spirit to overflowing, that their Christian lives could be an ambassadorship that would affect everyone in their lives that they encounter. And Lord, if there's someone here that never knew there was a fountain, never knew that you could satisfy and use them and, and their lives could be a conduit of your love and your power, I pray, Lord, that they would come to know you personally and intimately this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Would you go with us and walk with us everywhere we go and keep our minds fixed on you. We do love you so much. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful Sunday.